Hello and welcome. It has now been a full year that we have owned our CPO 2015 Tesla Model S 85D. And so in today's video, I wanted to go over the cost of ownership and operation, as well as just how well it has served our family. In our case, our Tesla is our primary family hauler. Uh, we only have two cars and neither of them are gasoline powered cars. We have our Tesla, and then we have a 2013 Nissan Leaf. And the Nissan Leaf is what I use to get to and from work. Uh, its range is definitely limited and I intend to do some other videos about it in the future. So if you're interested in seeing any of my future videos about our electric fleet and other things that uh, are interesting uh, to me, technology related, um, feel free to subscribe to my channel. So the Tesla we have owned has served us very well. There have been a few minor concessions that we've had to make and there have been some things that have been just fantastic about owning it. And so I wanted to go over some of the statistics here at the beginning, some of the information about what it's been like, and then we'll uh, talk to my wife and we'll sit down together and kind of go through some of the details of what it's been like for our family. So we, in our first year of ownership, have driven 22,656 miles. That is 36,461 kilometers. Now, our family actually doesn't normally drive very much, um, especially right now when I'm working from home, like most people around the world. However, uh, we have gone on a couple of epic road trips. So as an example of some road trips that we have, uh, we've gone on, well, when we first bought the car, we brought it home from Fremont, California. So that was kind of a, a road trip right there. Um, and then shortly after that, we went on a camping trip to Vernal, Utah, uh, where we had to charge at a, a NEMA 1450 outlet in a campground. So that's kind of an interesting thing. I haven't done a video on yet. We then went to Illinois, which is way far away. And that was a 4,000 plus mile uh, road trip. Uh, when we got back from that, almost the next week, uh, we went down to St. George, Utah and did a trip down there. So uh, that's more of a regional trip. Uh, we also went on a camping trip to Pinedale, Wyoming. And so that was in a pretty remote location, but we were able to make that work. And I intend to do a video about that someday too. Um, and then we went on our epic road trip to Orlando, Florida, which I created already a series of YouTube videos about. And so if you're interested in seeing that series, just click on this card that will pop out right here and you can watch that uh, series of videos to see how that went for us. Um, that was a uh, nearly 6,000 mile road trip in a period of 16 days. So that's obviously a, a lot going on in, in that particular trip. So between all of these trips, that's where the majority of these miles have come from. Uh, but of course, we've got a couple thousand miles in there built in that's just from us driving around town. The starting odometer when we purchased the car was 63,796 miles on the odometer. And now it's at 86,452. Um, with the uh, watt hours per mile that we've gotten over that time frame, it's been 332 watt hours per mile. Now keep in mind, I attribute that probably mostly to the fact that uh, a lot of the um, miles that we put on the car are on these road trips where we're on the freeway going 70, 80 miles per hour. And so the um, efficiency comes down from that. Now, if we take that 332 watt hours per mile that we've gotten on average, and we multiply that across the 22,656 miles that we've put on the car since we purchased it, um, that brings us to the total amount of electricity that the car has consumed while we've owned it in a year. And that was 7,521 kilowatt hours. That's a lot of electricity. Uh, I pay attention to my electric bill, just like most people do to some degree. Um, and I know roughly how much electricity our home consumes in a month. And this is a lot, like this is far more electricity than our entire house has consumed in many years. Now, that being said, it still is a lot cheaper when you look at the price per mile of electricity versus what it would have cost us to, to drive in a gasoline car. So as an example, in Utah, our average price for electricity is 10.9 cents per kilowatt hour. And so that would account, uh, that would add up to $819.87 for this amount of electricity. Now, in our case, we actually haven't spent a dime on electricity, like even a penny. We haven't spent anything to fuel our car for a year. Um, we have charged at hotels, at camping grounds. We have charged at uh, superchargers, which we got free unlimited supercharging when we bought our car from Tesla. 
Um, we've charged at friends and families' homes, and we offered to pay them for the electricity that we consumed, and they were all just happy to have us visit, and they did not um, want us to pay for their electricity. Now, in our house here, we have solar. And if you're interested in seeing uh, my videos that I've published already about our DIY install about solar, just click here on this card that will pop out and you can watch a couple of videos that I have there about that, uh, about the costs of uh, what it took to install solar. But in, the, in a nutshell, we saved a ton of money doing it ourselves and it should be breaking even in about two years. We did that installation back in 2017. So if we want to calculate the amount of electricity that has gone into our Tesla that is helping to pay off the solar, what we would do is uh, log into our Juicebox Pro 40 uh, dashboard and it shows us how much electricity has been uh, dispensed into our Tesla. And so I looked that up and, and then I took the amount of electricity, which is 4,135.9 kilowatt hours over the last year, and multiply that by the average cost per kilowatt hour for electricity in Utah, which is where we live, and that's 10.9 cents. And the total that we've actually uh, paid for electricity, in a sense, paid for, uh, is $450.81. And so in two years or so, we expect the solar to be paid off. And from that point forward, all of our household electrical consumption, as well as all of our driving that we charge at home, will be completely free going forward, which is going to be an amazing place to be. And frankly, I'm already happy with where we are right now um, because our electricity is in a sense kind of prepaid for. We paid for the equipment to get on the roof and is now just generating electricity for us every day. And right now in the spring, we have some days that are exceeding 70 kilowatt hours in one day, uh, which keep in mind our battery on our Tesla can hold 85 kilowatt hours and that takes us for about 256 miles and that's rated miles. So in any case, we're in a pretty good place there. So let's get into some other stats relating to our driving and just things that we've done with our Tesla. So for instance, we have charged at 62 unique different superchargers, 85 different times, and we have charged at four destination chargers. So that includes like restaurants, uh, hotels, and that sort of thing. Uh, and we've charged in 15 different states. Uh, we've given rides to 88 different people, and yes, I keep track just for fun. And um, there's probably a few more that I didn't quite uh, get noted because there were times where we were at, we were at group gatherings and there were just tons of people we were giving rides to. Uh, I've camped out overnight in the car four times and with all three of my children plus once by myself just to test it out first. And um, if you're interested in seeing any of those videos relating to camping in our Tesla, just click here and I'll have a pop out there for that. Um, and so a couple of times we have used the rear facing seats in combination with the three normal rear seats that have all car seats in them. And we have, so we've had five children in the car that were all five years old and younger simultaneously. And then us two adults, we had seven people in the car with, with five kids in car seats. These are all car seat aged kids. And if you've got any experience with minivans or SUVs, it's hard to fit five car seats in any normal car. And this car handled it just fine. We have the three across to the row in the back, and then we have the two rear facing seats, which are five point harness seats meant for kids of a certain size. And, and we had those kids. So that was cool. Uh, destinations we've taken the car to is, you know, we drove it home from Fremont, California. Uh, and then the other road trips that I've already mentioned, as well as um, just other regional places uh, in, in remote places around Utah, which I intend to do more YouTube videos about and, and uh, haven't made those just yet. So let's get into the repairs related to um, owning our Tesla. Now, when you buy a CPO Tesla, it is under warranty still through Tesla. Uh, it depends on how many, um, how many miles are on the car determines how, much, how long your warranty is. Because ours was over a 60,000 mile odometer reading, they gave us only a two year warranty uh, or up to 100,000 miles. So this year, if we don't drive over about 13,000 miles, then we won't exceed the warranty in the next year, but it, 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 we'll see which one comes first. In our case, it's a little bit close right now. So uh, we have had to have a couple of things repaired under warranty. Uh, first off, right when we first got the car, uh, the mobile service ranger came to our house and replace the Takata airbag, which if you're familiar with Takata and, and their airbag recalls, that affects virtually every vehicle manufacturer. So that's nothing unique to Tesla. 
Also, for what it's worth, we have actually never gone to the Tesla Service Center up in Salt Lake. Um, we, the service rangers have always just come in and done the repair in our driveway. Uh, within a f the a first week of us purchasing our Tesla, the uh, rear right door handle stopped popping out, which was a known weakness in this uh, make and model and year of car. And so they came and replaced the uh, little gear there that makes that pop out. Uh, then a little while later we had a uh, the left backup light, the white light uh, when you're backing up stopped working and so they came and replaced the whole light assembly there. Um, and then we had a problem where we would click the uh, button on our key fob or on the center screen to open our trunk and it would just pop up momentarily and then get cinched back down and then it would get in this funky state where it wouldn't latch and we'd have to reboot the car a couple of times and usually we could get it to work but it happened a couple of times and so I contacted them and they replaced the cinching mechanism which didn't end up fixing it so then they just replaced the, um, the latch and that fixed it and we haven't had any problems since then. And then we had a notice at one point to replace the 12 volt battery and so we contacted them again which once again to contact Tesla you just pull up the app on your phone you uh, maybe upload some pictures you explain what the problem is and then they contact you and get the um, the scheduling done well the scheduling is done through the app as well so they just confirm what they're going to do for sure so they came out and replaced the 12 volt battery at that point and that was a, an expected lifespan type of thing um, those are, are deep cycle batteries and they only last a couple of years but it kind of varies a little bit then we had a problem where the navigation would just, uh, just not navigate. We would tell it to navigate all kinds of places and just nothing would happen. And so I contacted them again through the app and they tried to fix it remotely and were unable to. So they sent out their mobile service technician and he connected directly with the hard wire to the car and had to wipe a few things. Uh, we lost a few user settings, but not, not everything. Um, and he got it working again. And so I, I don't know what was up with that, but that uh, was all. Uh, the repairs that we've had to have them fix. Now, there's a couple of things that I've had to pay for myself that are not covered under warranty. Uh, I've replaced the windshield wipers for $12. Obviously, that's something any uh, car will need. Um, we also had to replace the air filter, which uh, is a cabin air filter. Uh, this is there's, there's no internal combustion engine, so there's no engine air filter. This was just the cabin air filter. And in our particular model of car, that is really easy to do and I did it in like 30 seconds, uh, no, no big deal, and that was $18. Um, and then we've had to replace all four of the tires. When we bought the car, I didn't measure the tread depth, or I'm not, I'm not entirely sure where we came from. They probably were not brand new tires, um, but we got tens of thousands of miles of, off of them, and, and then we needed to replace them before we went on our trip to Orlando, Florida, because I wasn't totally sure what the weather would be doing, and we were down to, um, I think it was three tenths or something like that. So we needed to replace them anyway. And so we spent $890 and 67 cents replacing the tires with the Continental Extreme Contact DWS06 tires for what it's worth. And so all total, our repairs have come to $920 and 67 cents. And those aren't really repairs. Those are just wear items. Something else that's unique to this car or to Tesla's in general is software updates. Unfortunately, we don't get all the software updates that the newer cars get because our hardware is outdated. So a lot of times they'll be posting on forums like, oh, look at this cool new Sentry Mode feature or this new game, and we don't get anything uh, like that. But we have still gotten some features that have made our, our car better and, ha and have improved it. So uh, as an example, one feature that came out was where when you're navigated on a trip and your battery is cold, if you're going to a supercharger, it will warm up the battery so that it's able to charge at a higher sustained uh, rate of speed right when you first plug in. So that came along. Uh, camp mode came along, which before I had to just turn the climate control to on, which mostly worked, but the um, internal 12 volt power port would stop working as well as some other things. And so camp mode is, is a little bit better and that's nice for us. We've used that a couple of times. Um, then there's like some other miscellaneous additional information that's available in the vehicle information screen, which is a little bit useful sometimes. Um, also, it now lists when there are out of order uh, supercharger stalls when you are navigated to a supercharger. Um, also now it doesn't change the card to connect to your phone's Bluetooth until you sit in this driver's seat, which is nice because before we would open the door to start getting the car, kids in their car seats and then it would switch potentially too soon. And sometimes my wife would be on a call when she's doing that and then 
and all of a sudden the, the, the car is now connected to the call and, and the people can't hear her very well because she's outside the car. So that's definitely an improvement. Um, there are additional voice commands that are now available um, that we can speak and have it do things to the car. But because we have the older MCU version one, it's a little bit sluggish. So like for instance, uh, you can give it a command and you have to wait a few, a few seconds before it'll uh, process it and then do it, but it, it does work still. Um, it also now will read texts to us. So when we get a uh, text uh, from our phone, it'll feed through the car's stereo system and read it out verbally to you. And it'll also display the text on the, the front screen right in front of the steering wheel. Uh, you can also choose to turn that off, of course. You can also respond to that text and you have to speak really succinctly and slowly because our hardware doesn't process it crazy fast, but it does still respond to the text successfully. They've also added or taken the um, Easter eggs functionality and put it into a toy box and entertainment section in the tools tray for what it's worth. That's not really a huge deal. Um, they also have automatic navigation now where when you get in the car, it'll just automatically navigate you to a place that's in your, an address that's in your calendar um, that is synced with your phone uh, or home or work, depending on where you are and, and what it sees as available. Uh, they also added the I'm feeling lucky and the I'm hungry buttons in navigation just for fun. Um, and then there's some additional features that are on the app in the phone that they've added. Uh, one I can remember, for instance, is you can now open the Homelink garage door opener from the uh, button that they've added in the app on the phone. So it kind of feeds through the car in that case. And that's all the things that we can remember right now. I'm sure there's a few other features, but those are the ones that have affected us. There have been a a whole lot of other features that have affected the newer Teslas that, that, don't, um, that don't trickle down to us. Let's go now and talk to my wife and see what it is from her perspective, what it's been like to drive the Tesla as her primary car. Uh, because during the normal work week, I don't actually drive it. It's hers uh, to take around with the kids and such. I mostly drive it on the weekends or when we're on road trips. Jessica and I are here in our Model S, and I thought we'd just go over a couple of questions that we thought of uh, that some of you may be asking about what it might be like in a year of ownership having your primary car be a Tesla, in this case, the Model S. And so we've been using this Model S now, Jess, for a year. Um, how has it been? Have you had to make compromises, you know, having this car versus, say, the 2009 Honda Pilot we came from? I think um, charging is the big thing everyone's worried about when you go to an electric vehicle. Um, you can't just, if you're on a going somewhere, you can't just pull over to a gas station and five minutes later you be on your way. It takes a lot more planning and a lot more time. And that was my biggest concern probably in getting mm -hmm. a Tesla. Um, but besides that... Um, and that charging is only relevant on road trips, right? Yeah, usually. Because around town it has more than enough range for your normal daily needs and it charges up overnight. Yeah, if I remember to charge it to 100 on a longer day trip, that's usually fine too, but mm -hmm. yeah. That's... Uh, wh one thing I would mention is a compromise that uh, I had to make and, and you know that we made as a family was not being able to tow anything. We have a small fishing boat. We don't take it out a ton, but it's fun to take out occasionally. And right now we have to go borrow somebody else's vehicle to take it out uh, and, you know, because the Model S can't tow. So what is your typical use case for this car? Like, how do you typically use it? Uh, our oldest is five and has been in kindergarten this last year. And we don't do, we don't have any extracurriculars really that we go to. So it's mostly just shopping a couple times a month, grocery shopping, um, driving to parks with the kids. I mean, everything within 10 mile radius, usually. Um, occasionally, my mom lives a half hour away, my sister lives an hour away, and that's really the farthest that we would ever drive in a single day to go right. visit and someone. And at freeway speeds, this car can go for about three hours, so uh, going to your sister's house and back is using up maybe roughly two-thirds of the battery. I'll put here on the on-screen uh, what it typically takes up uh, percentage-wise on the battery. Um, and you haven't really needed to go to both of those places in the Not same in day. day. No. But in theory, you could, but it probably would take up about the whole range. Yeah, and both of those would be once a week, probably, maybe twice a week. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
but just local things around town usually. So how well does it work for your purposes, everything great. you normally do? Yeah, it works great. No, no compromises on a daily basis or no. anything? Okay. And uh, how about the rear-facing seats? Have those come in handy? Yeah, those have been really nice. I do like the, the quickness, I guess, of them. Uh, most of the kids we spend time with where we would need to use them are all small enough that they would fit there. So if we end up needing to take a couple extra kids somewhere, it's really easy to just pop the seats up and not have to worry about moving car seats and trading a bunch of things between cars. You can just put the new kids in and take it from there. It's been really nice. And the kids love riding in the back seat and being able to push the button to open the trunk and let themselves out. They think that's a lot of fun. Yeah, I would agree. But some will sometimes get to a destination and, and then I'll say to the girls in the back, okay, you can get out now. And they love being able to push that button and then crawl out themselves. Uh, what about the driver profiles uh, functionality, which moves the steering wheel and the seating positions as well as settings in the, in the screen? Has that been useful? Yeah. Um, I mean, it wouldn't be the end of the world if we didn't have that, but it is yeah. nice that um, it's programmed to each of our individual key fobs. So uh, depending on who's driving and who has a key fob, it just automatically remembers those settings and you don't have to adjust it every time. That's been really nice. One thing that I have found is for a long time I was not using the easy entry mode because it, it was easy enough for me to just get in and out of the car uh, with my normal seating position. Um, and then the girls behind me uh, found that whenever I drove, my seat's a little bit farther back and they had a hard time getting between the back of my seat and the car seat. And so I realized I could just turn on easy entry, which just moves the seat forward and uh, I can still get out easily, but it makes it automatic so that the girls can just squeeze out behind uh, my seat uh, between the car seat and the back of the seat. So that's convenient. Uh, what about the uh, autopilot functionality? We have autopilot 1.0 in this car, which means uh, that it uses the Mobileye technology before Tesla took it in-house and started uh, doing their own. So it doesn't get updated, uh, but it still works quite well. Uh, and we've used it for thousands of miles on road trips and such. But like on your daily living, have, have you used that functionality much? Uh, like I said earlier, we don't really go places besides around town. And I don't typically use cruise control or the steering one. Auto steer. Auto steer. Uh, when I'm going around town, if I'm on the freeway, I, I typically use both of them together. And we've taken quite a few road trips and that is really nice on road trips when you're just driving through nothingness and it, it's nice to have something else helping you stay on the road. What are you about the driving performance? Like just the, how, how does it feel driving this car versus the Honda Pilot for instance or other cars you've driven? Um, well the Honda Pilot was newer than other cars I've driven <laughs> already <laughs> and this is newer than that. It is a very smooth ride um, and it functions really well. Um, I drove a, a 93 Jeep when we got married <laughs> and it was quirky. <laughs> It had, had a lot of personality. It had a lot of personality <laughs> and a lot of things you had to do to it to get it to drive correctly. <laughs> um, and this car is just heads and tails different from that. It's very smooth ride. It's a very comfortable ride. Um, yeah, we, we like riding in it. It's fun to drive. And what I would add to is this car has a lot of get up and go just like all Teslas do. This isn't the performance model or anything. Um, but compared to other cars on the road, you definitely feel like you're driving around in a sports car, at yeah. least performance-wise, and how you can accelerate through traffic and get where you need to be. Uh, so, uh, charging. Um, as we mentioned on road trips, there's extra time you have to add to stop at superchargers. Um, although that was kind of nice, it gave us more time to adventure with the kids and explore and, and get them running around and stuff. Um, but when it comes to around town and at home, do you ever even have to think about charging, really? No. So you just drive the car? I just drive the car. And you don't have to go to the gas station, obviously? Yeah, or, or every, anything. I don't know, depending on how much we've driven, every three or four days, once or twice a week, we'll plug it in and get it to, what, 75, 80? Nowadays, I've been going mostly yeah. to 80%, yeah. But generally, it takes, and that's and then that only even gets down to maybe 30 or 40%. It doesn't get right super low and I don't usually bother plugging it in every time I drive it. Yeah, we, we do a lot of pretty short drives just like you said around town so it doesn't make sense to plug it in every single time we get home it's just a little bit more effort than we need to, to put out so um, I'll notice sometimes that the battery's down to say 50% and we'll plug it back in but um, 
it's definitely nice not having to go to the gas station just from a time and convenience perspective. Um, just kind of is ready to go whenever we need it. Yeah, it's nice we can uh, finish a road trip with no battery left and just drive straight home and not have to worry about getting gas or something on our way home. We can just get home and plug the car in and go to bed and not worry about it. Yep. Uh, what about the in-car entertainment, the um, the tune-in um, radio functionality, you know, internet-connected radio and stuff? Uh, that has been really nice. Uh, the girls like, there's some podcasts that we listen to that we're able to stream um, that we can do straight on the car or we can do the Bluetooth over our phones. And the podcasts are like kids' stories. Yeah, right? like you can, yeah. any podcast probably that you can yeah. find on your phone, you can find, Right. I would imagine, um, on the car. And yeah, it's been uh, nice doing the radio option that they have. Also, it's more of a variety of songs than we would probably pick to listen to if we were just listening to a tape or a CD or something. Right. So the girls like the variety there. And we do connect it to our phones as well. And you have some audiobooks on your phone that you listen to occasionally, stuff like that. Yeah. So the app that's on your phone that connects to the car, how often do you use that? What's your uh, most commonly used features? I don't use that a ton. Um, typically I'll use it if we've gone somewhere together and Anthony has the fob in his pocket and I don't want to find him to unlock the car and I'll use my phone to unlock it or pop the trunk or things like that. But I don't, I don't use it a ton. Um, and it doesn't work at all if there's no <laughs> right. data. There are so. times we'll, we'll go camping out in the wilderness and we definitely have to make sure we keep the key fob um, you know, and don't lose it because uh, there's no way, way to use the car from the phone in that case. So but it's nice that you can do that. I mean, it's for me, I'd say it's mostly a laziness aspect that I use it for. It's not ever mm -hmm. something that's... I could take two minutes longer and go find a key <laughs> right, right. to use it most of the time. And I'll do the same. Sometimes the key fob will be hanging up in the house and I'm out in the garage and decide I need to get something out of the car or move the car maybe and I'll just pull out my phone and, and turn it on from there because it's convenient. Yeah. Or if you've gone somewhere in the Tesla, I'll get on the app to see where he is and same. when he's going to be home. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she'll be at her mom's house or something and I'll check the app and then I can see when she leaves home and so I'll know when to expect <laughs> her. <laughs> Um, then when it comes to the uh, preconditioning, um, I tend to use that, I think, more than she does. I like to be able to turn on the air conditioning or the heater when we're on our way to the car so that it's more comfortable. Um, you're... I probably never have used that. Never? Never. I like it a lot. <laughs> uh, she tends to just uh, get to the car and open the door so the HVAC turns on and then she'll be getting the kids in their car seats and stuff. I and guess it's old habits die hard, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm used to getting to the car and you just open all the doors to cool it off and <laughs> by the time we get all the kids rounded up and in the car it's usually cooled off fine and I just don't usually think about it. Um, are there any software updates that we've received in the last year that you thought were great uh, that improved the performance of the car or took it out? Away um, performance? I'm sure we've gotten updates that have improved the performance that I don't remember Maybe or not notice, performance of driving but, characteristics um, but like just functionality. Sure I, the two that I can think of is there was one a little while ago that allowed the car to read your text messages off your phone to you while you're driving, which is kind of nice, I guess. Uh, you can also reply to the text. I haven't had great luck with it being able to understand what I'm saying, but it's nice to be able to hear it, I guess, if you're driving. Um, and then the camping mode where um, you can leave the car on all night while you're camping. The, and, the and systems. I'll even just use camping mode when we get somewhere and I know the car is going to be really hot and I'm uh, wanting to maybe charge some batteries. And uh, so it, the camp mode keeps the 12 volt port here on. And so that enables me to plug in my batteries and keep the air conditioning of the cabin on to keep the batteries cool and be charging while we're away. So I think strollers are somewhat notorious in, in like the family world. Uh, minivans you know, are known for having that great big reservoir in the back. Often you can put in a big old double stroller and we have a big double stroller. Um, how well does that fit in the back? It fits. <laughs> uh, I think we got a new one. We did, yeah. Around yeah. the same time we got this car. And I think our new one was a lot shorter, so it fit a lot mm -hmm. better. I think we really had to wrestle the other one in and have all the seats down and be sideways. And I think this one can, or diagonal, this one can fit with a little, it's way easier. I think you could probably mm -hmm. fit in the foot well. If mm -hmm. you had kids back there, but I don't know that I've ever tried it that would, specifically. It would stick up vertically in the footwell in front of the oh. children. Yeah, it wouldn't be completely in the footwell. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, it's not quite the same as a minivan if you had seven people in a minivan and then had a stroller behind them. It's a little bit less convenient because the rear facing seats are potentially using that footwell for their feet. They don't need all that space, little kids, but um, so yeah, it's less convenient. takes up a lot, but it does mm -hmm. fit. Yeah. Well, how often do you use the frunk, the front trunk? Uh, typically, not terribly often. Anthony will often keep his cords and charging apparatuses <laughs> uh, there, but if it's empty and we're doing some shopping or whatever, we'll put the bags in there because when we pull into the garage, uh, the front is in the garage closer to the door and we can just get out and walk past it and go inside. It's easier to, mm -hmm. to grab things. Uh, are there any regular problems you've had with the car? Inconveniences? I um, have a hard time with the lack of internal storage, mm -hmm. um, small storage maybe. There's no like cup holders or pockets or things on the doors to put things in or like pockets on the back of the seats or there's just, it's hard, it's hard to mm -hmm. find places to store things. So what we did is we uh, got a camera bag and put it here between the two front seats and it um, it allows us to put our water bottles in it as well as our sunglasses and other miscellaneous things It kind of replaces a center console because in this car the center console is just this flat tray uh, on the floor and then it has two cup holder uh, up here on the armrest so uh, we just keep some random um, odds and ends in, in there um, and then we use our water bottles up here in the camera bag yeah and that's worked but it still would be nice to have more sleeves and pockets and stuff throughout right. the car. What about the air suspension? Do you ever use that? Uh, occasionally. Uh, there's some driveways that we visit frequently that are quite steep or peaked. Un uneven, yeah. Uneven. So I'll use it occasionally for that. I don't typically, yeah, I don't, I can't think of other times I would use it. I'm never going on dirt roads by myself and if yeah, I usually take care of it really then. Really driving if I if we are so. And I mean the the air suspension obviously also just makes the ride smoother in normal driving conditions. Um, our normal dry our driveway we live in does not need uh, it's it's a pretty flat driveway so there's no problems there. Well, uh, how 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 well has the car worked for camping? Like I'm the one that has gone camping like sleeping overnight in the car with the kids. Um, but when we take the car on camping trips, how well has it worked in those cases? Um, it's fairly impractical for our size family to sleep in the car yeah. on a camping trip just because of how much stuff we have to take and we have three car seats and um, if you don't want them covered in dew you don't want to just right. we leave them out all, all night. Sleep in the car. Yeah. We'd have to take all of our stuff out um, of the car and then where does it sit? Yeah. Yeah, so we've had no problem fitting all the gear that we take camping. So we have a big, I don't know, twelve man tent. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got a huge bag full of all of our sleeping pad, sleeping bags and pads and things like that, and then clothes and chairs usually and various mm -hmm. food, whatever. So, but we've never had a problem fitting everything. So I would say it fits everything. Where it is limited is um, I don't necessarily want to put a lot of firewood in oh, the car. Sure. So sometimes we'll put a bundle of relatively clean firewood in the car. But I mean, compared to a truck and going on a long trip, it probably doesn't. doesn't but work that well could for that. that argument could be for any car you want to keep nice not a true tesla specifically That's for sure yeah what about the glass ceiling the sunroof uh, does that stuff matter to you has it been i always thought a sunroof would be really cool and i still think a sunroof is cool but i don't love driving with it down because it blows my hair all <laughs> in my face <laughs> um uh, the kids like to open it and stand on the center cup holder thing and sell ice cr sell ice cream mm -hmm. out of it throw imaginary yeah, ice cream it's, it's fun for the kids so they like hanging out of it but in general it's fun but i don't use it a ton right are there any useless features that the car has that we have never needed or or are even in the way i i don't know probably well the two that come to my mind is the covers so we oh, have yeah. a, a cargo cover that's in the back as well as a cover that, that goes on the floor cubby uh, there's a cubby that goes under the floor and there's a board over that when we got home with the car, when we first bought it, we took those out and just stowed them away in our garage and we've never used them, not even once. Um, we don't really need to cover our, our cargo area generally. There's not a huge problem with theft around here, but also we don't keep a lot of stuff back there anyway. Um, and then uh, the floor cubby, um, if the girls aren't, like if we have folded the uh, seat down into the floor, the rear facing seats, 
yes, that, that floor board that you can put in would make the whole trunk area a lot flatter and smoother, but that doesn't really matter to us. So we just let the, the chair still be there and it just drops down an inch. It's inconvenient. If we go somewhere and need to use the seats unplanned, pop up the back seats, then we're stuck with nowhere to put the cover. So we just haven't bothered using it at all. Yeah, it's easier just to leave the, the covers in the garage and not worry about it. It hasn't been a problem. So with that, I think that's all the questions that I have thought of to ask you and, and to answer myself. Okay. Um, if any of you have any questions for us, feel free to post them in the comments down below. Thanks for your time, Jess. Yep. <laughs> talking about the car and how it's been for the last year. and um... uh, Pleasure, as always. <laughs> I hope this has been informative for you to see what it's like to own a Tesla and have it as your primary family car and give you some idea of costs related to it. I decided to make this video because I felt like there was a lot of information out there that is either misinformation or just uh, not quite accurate. And I'm trying to put out more information out there in the world that is real world, firsthand experience using an electric vehicle in uh, you know normal family daily living and on road trips and, and the like. If you are interested in seeing additional videos relating to electric vehicles, solar, and technology, please subscribe to my channel and you'll get notified every time I upload a new video as long as you change the bell notification to all. If you don't do that, you may not get notified. And with that, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.